the recording. Um, and uh, for everyone uh, who is joining uh, later, we also will post this um, uh, online. Uh, and in Seed Interaction Lab in general, we invite various uh, researchers who work either on mobility or urban data um, and with people who are working in different disciplines coming from biology backgrounds as well as architecture. That for, that's why actually for us it was such a big um, pleasure uh, to invite uh, Sophia here. Um, and uh, it was um, particularly interesting for us uh, to invite her to talk about the non-extractive architecture project, which uh, she will present to you. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming you so and for sharing with us. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm Sofia Pia Belenki, and uh, together with Space Caviar, we recently launched this project called Non-Extractive Architecture, which is uh, a year-long live research platform that's looking at the balance between how we build and nature, uh, the role of technology and politics in, in material economies, and also our responsibility as an architect or as a designer, as a human being living on this planet as an agent of this transformation. Um, and so, yeah, it's a year long project, as you can see the dates on this poster um, at VAC Zatari, but it's actually something that I would argue we've been working on probably the entire time of our careers, especially with Space Caviar. And it's a project that we see with really long term ambitions, something that in a way, though, uh, here at VAC, it will end at the end of this month, um, but it will, in a way, just launch for the first time to the rest of the world and to the ways that we see this project extending and continuing onwards um, in the next bits. So this is a cover of the book um, from volume one. So in the spring to launch the project, we, we came out with a book called Non-Extractive Architecture on Designing Without Depletion, volume one. Um, it was named volume one because again, this is a project that is intended to um, continue and that will come up with volume two in the coming in this current year. Um, but this picture that we decided to put on the front of the book is maybe a bit strange for some of you. Why would you put a picture of the Barcelona Pavilion by Mies van der Rohe on a book called Non-Extractive Architecture? And I think it was because we wanted to look at architecture in this project and in uh, the future of um, our way of designing in a different way. So maybe in the past, we looked at an image like this of the Barcelona Pavilion by Mies van der Rohe. It's an image taken by Armin Linke, who is also part of this exhibition and part of the first book. Um, and in the past, we looked at this image and we said, wow, beautiful work of modernism, beautiful building, nice picture, whatever. Um, but I think what the project Non-Extractive Architecture is aiming to do is to look at an image like this and instead create discussions and reframe this kind of um, architecture around its externalities that went into making this work. Um, so like, what are the consequences of removing the stone? Where did it come from? who was the human body that cut it, uh, what tools were used, and what does the site look like now that it is gone, looking at all of the sort of complexities and externalities um, that often go into making architecture and how can we reduce those externalities um, and think of an architecture that doesn't deplete resources and doesn't exploit the humans and the planet. Um, so as we all know, architecture and buildings um, create around 40% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. It's an incredibly um, uh, important, it's, there's incredibly important statistics that we all need to be thinking about in this field. And it's even a question of like, should we be building any more in the future? As architects, we um, need to look at figures like this and completely rethink our profession. So um, I think this project is also attempting to broaden the discourse around architecture, to bring in other fields and to realize that no longer can we be a, a discipline that focuses on the built environment solely, but we need to think of all of these other layers, uh, the material science between behind architecture, the economic strategies, the labor practices, the community initiatives, and that all of this is part of a making of an architecture and that it's no longer something that comes from a sort of single figure as like the heroic architect on its own, but instead it if we're going to build in the future, it needs to necessarily be something that is a huge 
communal effort and that involves a lot of wide disciplines. Um, I think the idea of making sustainable or energy efficient architecture shouldn't even be discussed anymore. Like that should be taken for granted, of course. That's the only way we should be building in the future if we are, but it needs to go even much more beyond that. It needs to think about how we, we can completely shift our relationship to the, to the study of architecture, to the way we discuss architecture, and to what we consider as architecture. And maybe this discipline needs to be broadened and include other fields as well. So that's part of what we're trying to do with this project. So we launched it um, at VAC Zatra, we were invited by VAC, which is a foundation for arts. It's mainly based in Russia. They have a really large space called Guest 2 that just opened this year, or actually at the end of last year um, in Moscow. It's a fantastic, huge museum by Renzo Piano. Take a look at it if you haven't yet, but it's a really exciting art space. And they have a sort of secondary space here in Venice. And when they invited us to do an exhibition, um, uh, they're an arts foundation. They don't usually engage with architecture, but we were part of the sort of architecture biennale this year. So they wanted to have something that corresponded to that, I think. And what we came back to them was that actually we don't want to make an exhibition. Um, sorry, but we're not interested because exhibitions for us create a lot of waste. Um, they are just really temporary. They don't often have a, um, they're not often thinking about where the material goes afterwards, what is the long-term life of this research? And they're often showing things that are maybe made, been made in the past and then will either get returned to the artists. Um, there's a lot of fees of shipping works around the planet, a lot of pedestal designs that need to be built and exhibition design. And we wanted to kind of think about how could we change this format as well. And so we proposed that instead of doing an exhibition, we wanted to make a, a project um, and we would make a live research platform that would change over the course of the year and would produce a body of research and would launch at the end of the year a, a pro project and would launch a, a discipline and a way of thinking. Um, but we didn't know what that would look like and we don't know still, I think, in this final month what non-extractive architecture is. But I think what it is is an attempt to form an architecture that is trying to reflect on an alternative value system um, to that that has maybe previously been taught in architecture schools, to that that was passed down by modernism, and something alternative that we can um, move forward within our own practice and hopefully others that have been inspired through this project or had joined us in this pursuit. So yeah, we're, um, we came into the space um, and we we're articulating the research through several platforms um, and initiatives that activate it. So we have a group of 10 uh, international research residents that as much as we could came from different parts of the world and different disciplines. Um, during this time of COVID, this presented probably to be the hardest part of the project, just getting people's visas and through difficulties of travel during COVID times, but we managed to bring together a really exciting group of young researchers that come from backgrounds such as publishing, economics, uh, material science, uh, community social workers. Um, uh, we have, of course, architects as well, um, but also people more involved in in the sciences as well, like like maybe some of you. Um, and these parallel strands of research and residency, they're all working and living in Venice together with us um, and producing, publishing, um, taking part in public programming that happen every week and broadcasting and sharing this work uh, daily. And all of this is being collected as part of this exhibition, but more importantly, towards an online and physical archive, um, as well as a book, which I'll talk about soon. So we kind of turned what used to be in a gallery and all white walls, all the windows were covered. We removed all the coverings of the windows. We opened up the Palazzo again and we made it into our office. We made it into like a workspace. Um, we like to think of it as our new design studio and we've opened up the Palazzo as our sort of open door design studio. Anyone from the public can come in and witness our research happening firsthand. And all of these ideas are being collected towards volume two of the book, which will come out in the fall. And we're collecting all of these case studies, um, which I'll talk about soon, and a network of people that are also working on these ideas. Because the point is, non-extractive architecture is not something new. 
it's not something Space Caviar like invented or came up with on this exhibition. It's not something we are um, finding through this exhibition, but it's instead showing that there's already a huge network of people all over the world that are working on this topic and trying to bring or start to bring them together in this archive. So some of the things that we're thinking about are um, what if we can rethink architecture as a form of stewardship, um, of caring of, of a already existing built environment. So instead of designing new spaces, but instead um, the architect becomes something, someone of maintenance, someone that cares for a space. Um, we think also an important thing that will be need to be re redesigned um, immediately is the economies that we work within. So um, how we can, we can prioritize uh, long-term well-being instead of like a short reward um, and things that can favor circularity of material reuse and things like this instead of only growth, um, which we don't feel like is necessarily the the way the world needs to move. Um, and we want to think about um, material supply chains becoming more visible because I think often we don't think about the counter landscapes that our buildings come from. We don't think about the supply chains that go into making a work, um, the landscapes that are connected to it, the tower um, and what the pit was that um, it came from. So we want to think more about flow, not form, right? So I think if architects have dealt in the past with form as a, of a building and the way it looks or the shape it is, we want instead to think more about the flows of a building, the, the energy that a building takes and consumes and gives out, the, the flows of materials that go into making that building and the flows of humans that use it and that make it. And what if we start to bring all of those flows closer and closer to the site itself? Um, either using an already existing building and focusing more on renovation and reuse and maintenance, or thinking about ways of um, building, using materials that are uh, local, that are can be sourced directly on the site, that can be replenishable, uh, like forests and timber. Um, but again, timber doesn't make sense if it's coming from across the world, <laughs> being shipped on uh, cargo. Um, ships. So like, it's all about thinking about um, it, almost like a local movement, but for uh, local food movement, but for architecture. Um, so all of these kind of ideas are in this first volume of the book, which was a sort of theoretical framework that we set out um, to investigate this topic. And it brought together a lot of uh, great speakers, some of um, which maybe you're familiar with, like uh, Benjamin Bratton, who is the director of the terraforming that you were speaking about, um, that you've been part of, um, as well as uh, Keller Easterling and uh, Armin Linke, the photographer I mentioned, uh, Mark Wigley, um, and young designers and young economists, such as Luke Jones and Chiara Di Leone. Um, Eliza Turbe, who's been leading a lot of important discussions and movements around this topic with um, her things around post-carbon form. Um, and so this book was an important uh, first step, I would say, in collecting and starting this network. And this is an illustration from the book by Charlotte Malta Bartz that was looking at all of the components that go into making a building. And again, this sort of invisible counter landscape Luke Jones also tracing the flows of carbon between a timber building and a forest. Luke went on to be one of our research residents as well in the first cycle of the program. And um, to, do this, to do this research and to build the second book, we decided to make an exhibition. But again, we didn't wanna make a typical exhibition. So we wanted to make something that didn't produce waste and that could uh, in the future or even during the exhibition, be transported and be um, mobile and be everywhere and anywhere at the same time, something that could be truly collective. Again, we didn't want to ship things around the world. We didn't want to make an elaborate display system that would just then be trashed afterwards. So we wanted to rethink the what it meant to make an exhibition. We wanted it to be a tool, something. Um, so to do this, the only thing that we actually made in the Palazzo was a workshop space. So we turned one of the gallery rooms into a large workshop laboratory. This is actually just half of it. Um, it's mainly a woodworking lab, but we have also wet room space and a lot of fancy ventilation and tools and 
um, everything that we need to build anything that we wanted for the exhibition, but also for the researchers to experiment with. And every week we have different guest material scientists coming in and leading material workshops with the research residents, teaching us new techniques that we could then um, move directly from the workshop space and from these different testing sites into the exhibition sort of in a full um, live uh, shift. Um, so what we're doing in the exhibition is we're collecting hundreds of case studies, case studies of interesting materials, case studies of policies, labor practices, community initiatives, um, architectural frameworks and design strategies, and a network of people that are like working on this topic from economists to material scientists to uh, social workers, like I mentioned, lawyers, it's, it's part of a large network of people. Um, and we're building this network based on the researchers' interests and what what leads their their interest, and then that connects to another thing, and then we end up calling this person or asking for a sample. Or um, these samples are coming from a group in IAC. Um, they have a really advanced school uh, master's program in three D printing with Earth specifically, and one of the researchers um, was studying this, so we did some workshops with them, and she is now like working to 3D print with volcanic ash. And she went to Iceland and has been studying the way they make turf houses. And this is connected. Um, this becomes like part of the exhibition to her research and the people that she brings in and the conversations that she had. These are all part of like the, how we build the public program. But all of the, um, the tables or any of the exhibition surface gets made within um, our lab. All of the samples get made there and then we um, display them on surfaces like this wood comes from a friend who also gave a lecture he brought the wood he's um, he's making his own limb lumber I'm sorry timber lumber um, and drying his own wood and then after the exhibition it's going to go on to have a new life in another project of his um, and so we just build what we need. So this is another researcher's project. He's building a small house based um, on doing different techniques. This is the house in progress, but since it's taken, since this photo has been taken, it's changed a lot. But um, this was the first wall where he was using um, dowel cross laminated timber instead of glue uh, cross laminated timber. So cross laminated timber is an amazing technology for building, um, but the glue is a bit problematic. So he was experimenting with different YouTube techniques he could learn. And one of them is making his own dowel cross laminated timber. And the idea is that this house will go on to have another life um, in a, a secondary site um, where non-extractive architecture will continue in the future on a remote island in Portugal. And uh, the other machine you see is the 3D printer that another resident is using for testing um, her volcanic ash studies. And uh, the way we make this exhibition is um, through this material workshop, but also through a grid of pieces of paper, simply uh, nailed in a grid along all the walls of the palazzo. Um, maybe you saw in the previous slide, Oop, I can't go backwards, but um, it's, it's not totally normal paper. It's actually made from seaweed from an invasive species from the lagoon. And it's, um, it, it's a nice paper, but it's basically just sheets of white paper along the walls. And anyone can make this exhibition, right? You just need an A3 um, uh, printer, uh, black and white ink. And um, we built a tool, which I'll share with you soon on how anyone can uh, use this archive and use our, our tool to make their own exhibition. And this idea came from this exhibition we came across called uh, from UNESCO in 1949. They made this exhibition when the Declaration of Human Rights had just come out a few years prior. And what they did was they released 110 annotated images on simple sheets of paper that could just be downloaded or mailed um, to different government offices, classrooms, um, schools around the world and um, yeah, different offices. And the idea was just to show different moments in history of human rights and to show that that it's a, it was said something, at the time it was a new idea, right? It was a novel or an abstract notion. Although at, just like non-extractive architecture, it's something that has existed for all of time, all of humanity is human rights. And we feel kind of the same way with non-extractive architecture. And non-extractive architecture is not something new, but in fact, 
has is probably the oldest and the most important form of architecture that has always existed. So we wanted to also make 110, each um, resident would make 110 uh, case studies that they feel are important to illustrate this idea of what non-extractive architecture is. And what we're doing is um, collecting all of these case studies, both physically on the walls of the palazzo. And so every week you come in, you see new case studies, new ideas from the research residents as they continually um, produce around five to 10 new case studies every week. And then by the end, we're gonna collect all of these hundreds and hundreds, around 1000 ideas and put them in the second volume of the book. And um, this is kind of coming, these are different illustrations of coming up with the concept. We developed this with Interiors Agency who are also part of the first volume of the book. And what we did was we invited this graphic design group actually from Paris called F451 to build us what we call the exhibition format editor. And so what the exhibition format editor does is it automates the translation of all of our research into exhibition form or into book form. And it um, renders it visually and allows us to create like different schemas for the wall, different layouts. Basically all you have to do is upload one to three images um, following a very similar layout visually to the 1949 exhibition from UNESCO. Uh, you add your title, author name, and a short, very short text. And this short text also comes from ideas like the Zettel custom system for note taking of like a very short amount of text to share and process information. Um, and then the image gets, oh shoot, you can't see, but the image gets to like a bitmap texture on it, um, which removes um, co copyright issues. And it also makes it really easy to share the, the image. It makes it really low res. Um, we wanted all the imagery to have the same quality, to have the same sort of feeling because to give this uh, uniformity to the research, but also to not have a hierarchy between different case studies. Um, it also means that when we're creating a huge network, the idea of this project is to make an incredibly large archive and network of people and ideas. And we need to keep uh, the resolution and the amount of text really short and really tight in order to build this really large archive. And the idea is that anyone can download this exhibition or add to it in the future. So we're gonna go live with the archive at the end of January. And in a way the exhibition will just begin then because then many different institutions, maybe your own, will then take on this exhibition and produce their own version of it or add to the research online. So the way we make this exhibition is, again, through just white pieces of paper on the wall, uh, a material workshop space to make any samples, but also we have these three vehicles that we commissioned from N55 XYZ Cargo. And these vehicles are bicycles. Um, and you might say like, okay, a bicycle is probably the worst vehicle for Venice, right? Because there's only water and bridges and we should have made a boat. But actually we decided to make bicycles because um, exactly again, that the exhibition is only intended to begin in, in Venice, but then intended to travel afterwards. So these three vehicles will go on to the next site wherever non-extractive architecture goes next maybe to you, maybe to Peru, maybe to China, maybe to Africa, um, and they will continue to have a, a life on their own and produce more research toward, towards this archive and towards maybe volume two or three or four of the book. Um, and so this is where we print um, the research and um, also we collect different ideas from the public that shares with us more case studies. Then this is the second vehicle where we broadcast all of the research and we also do uh, different recordings with these weekly guests that come um, to us and share their ideas and their research. And lastly, we have a library. So the library is where we, of course, also research um, and we're producing a large library that will go on to um, be shared with the public, but also kind of grows over the year. So in the beginning, we started with one book, our first volume of uh, non-extractive architecture. And then as the year has progressed, the library has been filled with all of the research needs from the residents and also uh, different guests that come and bring a book based on their writing or their research. And yeah, then the idea is that they go out and share the research and they share the conversations and that they 
continue this ongoing work. We're also physically archiving all of the information, but the main thing is that we're working on this online archive database where anyone can search uh, what are some interesting things going on in France. Um, you could add in your own case study and your own research that you're working on. You could search for <coughs> combinations of tags like lumber, um, I don't know, biology and uh, labor practices and see case studies that involve three tags or two tags or a hundred tags and um, sort through this large archive like this. And it will start with around 1000 ideas, but it will hopefully continue over the next 20, 30 years through many different iterations of this exhibition and many um, different people that get involved with it through residency programs, through lectures, through uh, conversations that we hope are just beginning now. And these are some of the guests that have come so far, just a few faces like Holly Jean Buck, BC Materials, Who Builds Your Architecture, Space 10, Julia Watson, Indy Johar, Dan Hill, Lucas Wegworth, many more. And you also uh, collaborated was, uh, with Dark Labs, or it was more like a visitors? It was a visitor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are all visitors. Um, but in a way, that is collaboration, like I think. Um, yeah. And then this is sort of how all of the case studies are going to be displayed in the book. Um, so the second volume of the book will become a sort of handbook or guidebook on how to make non-extractive architecture with hundreds of these great ideas. And I think, yes, volume two comes out in the fall, stay tuned. It will be really thick, like a phone book, like a, um, yeah, hopefully a, a tool book on how to, how to make architecture with a lot of contact information, a lot of material resources, and a lot of the great ideas that have been uh, generated, but also just connected with over the course of this year. And hopefully there will be volume three, four, or five as the work continues. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I think I will for now stop uh, the recording so that people maybe can be uh,